Hello, my name is Nick Bright, scholar of East Asian religions. And I'm Proven Paradox, a guy with a lot of questions. And you're listening to Bright on Buddhism, a podcast where we discuss East Asian Buddhism, answering listener-submitted questions from listeners just like you, and introducing concepts of Buddhism that you may or may not be familiar with in a casual, conversational setting. Enjoy. Hermit, have you ever lost anyone? Yes, in my time on this earth I have lost many. How have you handled it? I have grieved and celebrated, laughed and cried, and slept and woke. It has been different every time. I have participated in every type of ritual, buried some and cremated others, and lived on. Has any of that helped ease the pain? Frankly, no. What does? I suppose the living on. Tending to my own matters, continuing to learn of the world, and occasionally finding new people to share it with. Everybody thinks their way to cope is the best way. As for my way, I can't relate with death and those who have died. They are the ultimate and most distant other, and yet we live in the world they created and left behind. We stand on the shoulders of the giants who have come before. What ought we to do? We must become giants upon whose shoulders the future will stand, and live life as death and death as life. I wonder what the Buddha says. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Bright on Buddhism. This week, we will be dealing with a difficult but important topic. We will be discussing the doctrine, ritual, and culture around death in Buddhism. How does Buddhism deal with death? What are some of the doctrines surrounding death? How do these doctrines play out in ritual and practice? We hope you enjoy. So, how does Buddhism deal with death? If there is anything that I hope you have learned by listening with us, It is that there are many varied doctrines and perspectives. So, we cannot and should not treat Buddhism as one single thing here. It would be more appropriate to say Buddhisms. That said, one of the most common doctrines in Buddhism is reincarnation. Upon one's death, the five skandhas, or the five aggregates, disaggregate and reaggregate into a new form according to your karmic history. If you have more good than bad, you are reborn in a better realm. If you have more bad than good, you will have a worse rebirth. That's fairly common, and that's what plays out the most in ritual and practice. However, there is more to it than just that. Buddhists acknowledge the existence of grief, sadness, and the feeling of loss that comes with death by those who are still living. How is that to be dealt with? In Buddhism, there are many practices surrounding mindfulness of death, decay, and extinction. These meditations involve contemplating your body as not your own, as decaying and rotting before your very eyes, as being temporary, as being very loosely held together, and as being an animated corpse, also as being funerary ashes, and things like that. These doctrines of mindfulness of death are meant to break one's attachment to one's body. Attachment to one's body is, more often than not, mistaking the body as self, and we want to learn to break attachments, especially attachment to the perpetuation of self, because self is empty. That being the case, there are a lot of sutras, commentaries on sutras, rituals, and ceremonies surrounding death in Buddhism, so many to the point that Buddhism is often thought of as a death religion or a death cult in East Asia. What are some of the doctrines surrounding death? Starting in Indian Buddhism and Chinese Buddhism, in the early forms of Buddhism that we know of, there was a figure called King Yama. This was a local Chinese deity who got incorporated and syncretized into the Buddhist canon when Buddhism traveled from India to China. This used to be your typical death deity. He carried deceased people from one life to the other. In that regard, he was the god of the six realms of samsara. We've talked about these six realms before, but these six are the realm of hell dwellers, that of hungry ghosts, animals, humans, jealous gods, and non-warring gods. This doctrine got ever more complicated in China and in Japan and Korea as Buddhism traveled around East Asia. So we've talked about the relationship between karma, death, reincarnation, and meditation. However, I should add one more doctrine into the fold to help us understand what's going on with a lot of the ritual culture surrounding death in Buddhism. We have talked before about how karma plus non-self equals merit transfer. I'll explain that once again in some more detail. If you remember, because nobody has a capital S unchanging permanent self, 
Karma is not just mine or yours. Karma is all of ours in the sense that cause and effect is a universal reality. That being the case, merit can be accrued and transferred. For example, if a monk copies a sutra in the presence of an audience, or if he recites it to them, he accrues merit for himself by copying or reciting the sutra, but the audience also accrues merit for hearing the sutra or witnessing the ceremony. Because the monk created the causes and conditions that allowed the event to occur, he is transferring the merit to others. In the context of death, most funerary rituals in East Asia are merit transfer rituals for the deceased in some form. These merit transfer ceremonies are done for the purpose of karmically propelling the deceased into a better rebirth. This is also based on a doctrine that originates in Tibet. In Tibetan Buddhism, when a person dies, they enter into bardo, or this liminal in-between realm that's kind of similar to limbo in Catholicism. They allegedly stay there for 49 days, and the ritual activity of the living guides them to a better rebirth. In Chinese Buddhism, this is called Zhongyo, and in Japanese, it is called Chu. This doctrine determines the ritual practices that happen around death. Similarly, according to many Mahayana Buddhists, karma can be purified, and many rituals that happen when somebody is about to die involve karma purification. Through certain practices like chanting the name of Amida Buddha, or Amitabha, for Pure Land Buddhists, or Shakyamuni's name for Zen Buddhists, or the name of the Lotus Sutra for Nichiren Buddhists, one can purify bad karma that they've accrued over their lifetime and turn it into good karma. So when somebody knows that they are about to pass away, they can engage in karma purification in this way. Additionally, once somebody has already passed away, dreaming plays a significant role. Dreaming is extremely significant in all of East Asian Buddhism, and I would argue as well in South Asian and Indian Buddhism. Because of the non-duality of concepts such as here and there, or now and then, the Buddhists argue that in a dream, the dreamer's mind actually goes to the time and place that they're dreaming about, and that they actually meet the people and the characters that they have encounter in those dreams. Thus, the events in a dream actually happen. So when a person dies, the living, be they clergy or be they just the survivors of the family, what have you, they often wait for some sort of dream confirmation that the deceased has experienced a favorable rebirth. And the way that this dream usually occurs is they either meet a Buddha in their dream or they dream about the deceased person in some positive way. And there's lots of other ways that this dream can manifest itself. But I think that this is a great way to handle the psychology of grief, because it gives doctrinal support for something that was going to happen anyways. Who are you thinking about whenever somebody has passed away? The person who's passed away. And then what are you dreaming about? You're dreaming about what you're going to think about day in and day out. So it's highly likely that when someone dies, you're going to have a dream about them, especially if you're close to them and have a strong emotional feeling about that person's passing. And so this gives doctrinal support to somebody's grieving process. And it makes the, the grieving process feel a little bit easier and more spiritually satisfying than thinking that they're gone forever, forever. And so I think that this is one of the highlights of Buddhism's support of the worldly experience of someone who's lost somebody else. At some point, we're going to have to do a longer episode about this dreaming topic, simply out of my own curiosity. But for now, let's leave it there. The next question. How do these beliefs play out in ritual and practice? I should say to start with that my answer will be pretty much entirely confined to East Asian Mahayana Buddhism. Things function differently in Theravada Buddhism, and I'm just not familiar with that as much as I am with Mahayana. In Mahayana Buddhism, as somebody gets near to the end of their lives, many Buddhist sects ordain them as monks or nuns as a merit transfer activity. This also plays a role in the karma purification activity. So somebody is near death, and they are given a monastic name, and they are taking the precepts, and they're becoming a member of whatever branch of Buddhism they're typically affiliated with in a serious, committed way. And the purpose of this is that taking the precepts is purifying your karma, it's accruing good karma, and it will help you whenever you pass away. Because of rebirth, ordinations are for more than one lifetime. 
So the dying person takes the monthly vows for many lifetimes, not just the rest of their current one. So that means that when the person is reborn in the future, they will still be a monk who is affiliated or beholden to the temple that they've just taken the precepts with. As an ordained monk or nun, the dying person will then do more karmic purification rituals as much as they are able. They'll chant different things depending on their school of Buddhism, like we've talked about before. They'll meditate or visualize the Buddha, or they'll participate in larger scale rituals. Then, when they pass away and enter into this bardo, or this jongyo, or this chu, this limbo realm, the living then start to do merit transfer rituals for 49 days after the death of the individual. These rituals often include the family, and they include cremation and preservation of remains, merit transfer through sutra recitation or copying or lecturing, and then finally, a memorialization that looks quite a lot like a funeral we would see in the West. This memorialization, however, has some different characteristics from Western-style funerals. They often include torches, which are meant to guide the deceased from this life to the next, and these rituals often stop after 49 days, and then after that, it's up to the family, and not the temple they're affiliated with, to memorialize and maintain the gravesite on their own schedule. In some cases, the family will create a shrine in their home, which is related to traditions of ancestor worship that have existed in East Asia long before Buddhism in East Asia. To that end, they are worshipped, given offerings, and ritualized as Buddhas in the home. These shrines are often the same shape and size and style as a Butsudan, or a Buddha cabinet shrine, showing that these ancestors are typically equivalent, at least in the minds of the living, to the Buddha in this case. Additionally, I should mention that after these cremations, the remains that are left behind when a person is cremated are often treated with great reverence and respect. These relics are of great importance. Part of the reason for this is that there is a doctrine in Buddhism that only Buddhas or only Bodhisattvas, only people who have accrued a huge amount of merit, leave behind solid relics whenever they're cremated. So, the idea is that a bad person will leave behind only ashes, only powdery dust that is not really anything, and good people who have strengthened their meditation and strengthened their karmic connection to the Buddha will leave behind some kind of bone or something like that, anything that you can pick out of the ashes. And those relics are preserved because they are thought of to be that person and representative of that person's good karma, and they're thought of as being very, very important. And instead of keeping ashes in an urn, as we would do in the West, the powdery bits are thrown away. They're kind of done away with. And the solid bits that didn't actually burn up, those ones are kept behind to represent that person's awakening, that person's mindfulness. Additionally, I should also mention that there are a number of bodhisattvas whose primary domain of influence is the recently deceased. These include Avalokiteshvara and Kasita Garba, whose primary job in certain Buddhist schools is to escort the deceased through the bardo liminal space. These bodhisattvas are often prayed to and have ceremonies for them and are objects of worship. We'll talk much more in depth about both of these characters in another episode. This is kind of a preview to the next episode where we will talk in great depth about Avalokiteshvara in particular. So one thing I've noticed that I would like to circle back on, the number 49 seems to be coming up a lot. Is What's the significance of that? Seven is a number that comes up all the time in religions all over the world. And it's because it's got like a perfect structure to it. And 49, of course, is seven times seven. seven squared. Yeah. And so there's this idea that that 49-day period is the period where they're figuring out where they're going to go next. I don't know what the actual origins of it are, but I do know that in the sutra concerning the actual death of the Buddha, the Maha Parinirvana Sutra, or the Great Passing Away Sutra, in that sutra, that's the first place, I think, where you see that the survivors, the grievers, the mourners, they do 49 days of ritual after the person has passed away. Now, the Buddha in that sutra, he, he was passing away for good. He had achieved perfect, exemplary nirvana and was gone from samsara after that. 
that was his final death and he made it certain to everybody made it known to everybody the audience that he wasn't coming back that he was not going to be reborn and still in that case everybody that was left behind did 49 days of these rituals and so how that got kind of replaced over funerary rituals for people who are going to be reborn i'm not quite sure but as we well know, I mean, seven, there's seven seals of the apocalypse in the book of Revelations. Seven is a very important number in the Bible and in Judaism and in Islam. Seven is one of those numbers that humans just like, I think. It's hard to count in sevens in our heads. So yes, they seem more significant. Like anytime I'm doing prime factors, seven is always the one that I have to stop and be like, okay, is this a weird one that's divisible by seven? Other divisible numbers have really easy ways to, for the low primes at least, have pretty easy ways to just look at the number and say, is this correct? But you can't do that with seven. It's true. Yeah, it's true. You can always tell a number is not prime whenever it's you know an even number at the end. Three is also really easy. Yep, three is pretty easy because it's either going to be a three, six, nine, or an even number. Mm -hmm. Five is easy. Exactly. Seven is one of those ones where there's one in the center and then there's three on either side. And then you can build a superstructure of that based on seven squared. And that's actually how they break down the scheduling for these 49 days of rituals. So the first three days are one thing, and then there's a big thing on the fourth day, and then another three days of something different, and then you move into a whole other phase. So it's 49 rituals broken down into seven categories or seven phases of rituals. And the way that they play out is all related to merit transfer. It's all related to trying to guide the deceased through this bardo, this chu'u, this liminal space. and at the end of that, that's when they start to wait for confirmation that, oh, this person has actually attained their better rebirth. And I should mention also that in most cases, the cremation is one of the final things that happens. So for that 49 days, depending on which school you're a part of, there could be the cremation at the end or there could be the cremation at the beginning. But it's very rare, if ever, that it's somewhere in the middle, somewhere in one of those middle stages. Um, they usually either do it pretty fast or they preserve the body and wait until the end of all the rituals to do it because that's kind of a big one. That's kind of one of the ones that the family wants to be there for, that the monks want to oversee, the clergy want to oversee, and one of the ones that's doctrinally important because of these relics that we've spoken about. Thank you for joining us this week. Join us next week where we do a deep dive of the Bodhisattva Kanon also known as Avalokiteshvara in India and Guan Yin in China. Who is Kanon? What are some stories about Kanon? What sort of devotional texts and rituals are there for them? We hope to see you there. Thank you for listening. Thank you. See you next week. My name is Nick Bright, scholar of East Asian religions and the voice of Hearer. And I'm Docs, editor, question asker, and voice of Hermit. And this has been Bright on Buddhism. Thank you for listening. If you like our podcast, or if you have a question you'd like us to discuss, we'd love to hear from you. Please consider leaving a comment or a review, subscribing, or joining us on social media. Email us at bright.on.buddhism at gmail.com. Tweet us at Bright Buddhism. And join us on our Discord server, The Hidden Sangha. Link in description. As always, citations and resources for this episode can be found in the show notes. Thank you. See you next time. Thank you very much.